Good morning. It's good to have you with us today uh, on this Sunday morning from the Ravenna Church of Christ. And we pray, pray that this will be inspirational to you and that you can worship God uh, today in an acceptable manner. During this time of the year, we hear much said about the birth of Christ. We see the uh, displays uh, in front of church buildings uh, and uh, in lawns of our homes. And I, I'm wondering how much we really understand about what took place when Christ was born. We accept the truth of the virgin birth, but I'm just wondering if we understand much about what really, really God was doing when he implanted uh, the sperm in Mary's womb to cause the birth of, of Jesus, you see. There are two scriptures that we turn to in the Gospels, one in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, where the angel said to Joseph, after he was very concerned about the uh, pregnancy uh, of Mary. The angel said, but while he uh, taught, uh, thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, uh, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The second verse is in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The angel answered Mary and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. The angel informed Mary of her pregnancy. Uh, and it's interesting to see uh, her, her response. The first verse that we quoted, Matthew 1 verse 20, was a verse where the angel calmed the nerves of Joseph and convinced him that Mary certainly uh, was not an immoral person. The second verse, the angel Gabriel announces to Mary that she would give birth to Jesus. Pulling these two verses together, we see the basis of our faith in the virgin birth. They were firm in expressing the fact that Jesus would be born by a miraculous action of God uh, and not by some natural means. Today, this idea uh, is something that is very fundamental to our faith uh, in Jesus Christ. It is the fundamental doctrine that forms the basis of Christianity. Up until about 150 years ago, there was little debate about the virgin birth of Christ. But with the rise of liberal Christianity, many theologians have attacked this truth, classing it as fantasical superstition. And they have branded it as a legend created to make Jesus seem in the mind of many as divine. Or they contend that the church has borrowed uh, this idea from pagan myth uh, or simply a Jewish tradition. They also contend that the New Testament is basically silent outside these two verses in Matthew and Luke who limit the announcement uh, of Jesus just to these two writers. This would suggest that the apostles gave little importance uh, to the event. But on the other hand, if you read carefully the rest of the Gospels, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, for example, and many other passages in the New Testament, you will find numerous statements made concerning the miraculous conception and the virgin birth of, of, of Jesus. You see, 
The virgin birth is a truth that divides Christianity from the world. It separates those who believe in the divinity of Jesus and the people who attempt to discount uh, his mission on, on earth. It says to us that Jesus was more than just a good man, a moral teacher, and perhaps a divine prophet. He was the very only begotten Son of God. Again, as we read in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever so believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There are three questions that we need to ask concerning the virgin birth of Christ. Number one, what does it mean? What do we mean when we say that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit? We mean at least five things. Number one, Jesus was born by the direct operation of God. Uh, it is clear that no one was expecting what was about to happen. Joseph assumed the worst until the angel intervenes and assures him that Mary indeed was not immoral. Mary herself was shocked and mystified when Gabriel informed her of her pregnancy. The shepherds and the wise men had no conception that a baby was to be born of a virgin in Bethlehem. And they had to come and to see the event. It happened solely uh, because God willed it to happen. God did it this way because he chose how it would happen. A virgin could only give birth to a child by the sovereign choice of an almighty God. There simply was no other way for Mary to give birth to Jesus. Number two, there was no man involved in the process. It's interesting to read the works of the skeptics as they try to deal with the virgin birth. Some of them will say that Mary, as a normal teenager, was really immoral. She had an affair with a Roman soldier, or maybe some other man in the area, which explains her birth. They don't understand, they can't believe that God would be the father of Jesus. And so therefore they have to explain the birth of Christ in their own words. While Jesus had a human mother, and his birth was just like all of us, as we were born of our mother. The birth of, Je of Jesus was not extraordinary. The conception is the miracle. It is the point that we need to focus on today. Jesus did not have a human father. He was fully human because he was born like everybody else, like you and I, born of a human mother. He was fully divine in that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He is one person possessing two natures. He is therefore without sin. He can be called in Luke chapter 1 verse 35 as the Holy One. He is holy in the truest and deepest meaning of the term. Number three. As a result of his miraculous conception, he met three important demands. Number one, he must be a total human person. An angel could not bear the infinite price uh, to uh, pay for our sins. He must be an infinite man. A mere mortal could not qualify to pay the divine price for our sins. He must be an innocent man. He could not be guilty of sin. A sinner would uh, make his uh, death nothing more than one of us. 
nothing more than all the animals that were sacrificed years before he came to this earth. He had to be someone who could live a perfect life, live above sin, and then in paying the price for our sins, not his own, then he was able to become our Savior. And then lastly, the virgin birth that guarantees that our Lord fulfills every demand of the wrath of God. Because he was born of Mary, he was fully human. Because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, he was fully divine. Because he was born holy, he is sinless in thought, in word, and in deed, and is totally qualified to be our Savior. Question number two, how did all this happen? What actually took place when the Holy Spirit enabled Mary to conceive Jesus in, his, in her womb? How could God, who was without limits, enable a microscopic speck to fertilize Mary's womb and enable her to produce a child? The most honest answer that I must give is I just don't know. There are some things that I cannot explain. There are some things that are beyond me. They are a miracle of the highest form. This is true with the creation. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was up on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Verse 2, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness night. So the evening and the morning were of the first day. How did this happen? I don't know. Scientists and theologians have been debating the creation for centuries. But they're no closer to a conclusion now than they were two centuries ago. The miraculous conception of Jesus is of a similar nature. It was the direct creative miracle of God. Sure, it's a mystery. And we'll never be able to fully, as a human being, understand what took place. God does not ask us to understand it. He just asks us to accept the fact. You can take all the scientists from the best labs and give them unlimited resources in a thousand years, and they still will not be able to duplicate or explain the miraculous conception of Christ. Only God could create a human in the virgin's womb who is fully human and yet fully divine. You see, it's a matter of what we think of God, what we believe about God. It's a matter of God's power and God's sovereignty, and God's authority. And we accept the fact that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that now works within us, and worked within Mary. Question number three. What difference does this make? This might be the fundamental question that we need to ask. It is so easy to put a sermon like this in the category, nice, but it doesn't matter. We make so many huge mistakes. There are three implications to consider when we consider the miraculous conception of Jesus and the record that we maintain uh, in the Gospels, even Matthew and, and Luke. It speaks to Bible authority. We are faced today with a difficult decision. If we discount the truthfulness of the miraculous conception as recorded in Matthew and Luke, what does that do to our understanding of the truthfulness of the Bible entirely? Matthew and Luke tells us that Jesus entered this world as a result of the supernatural miraculous act of God. The same writers tells us that Jesus left this world in a similar miraculous action of God. We're talking about the bodily resurrection as recorded in each of the Gospels. 
The problem arises when we consider the resurrection and as it gives us a hope that one day we will be resurrected. You see, the virgin birth of Christ does not give us much information concerning the physical birth, but the significance concerning the authority of the Bible must remain constant. If you cannot believe the first miracle uh, of the Gospels, how can you place any significance on the second miracle? You see, the Apostle Paul dealt with this issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he said in verse 19 of that great chapter, that if we have hope only in this world, King James Version says that we are among all men most miserable. That's what's wrong with the world. And that speaks to us as to the solution needed to solve the problems of the world. If this world does not believe in the virgin birth of Christ, it doesn't believe in anything. It doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in Jesus, doesn't believe in the Bible. Have no basis upon which to have any hope at all in this world. You see, this affects what we believe about Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 24, that if we do not believe that he is the I am, we'll die in our sins. I suggest to you that we need to believe not only that Jesus came to this earth. We do not need to believe only that he was born of Mary. We do not need to believe in the role the virgin birth, birth placed in the presence of Jesus on this earth. If we have a problem with the virgin birth, we have a greater problem with the person of Jesus. If you have a problem with the virgin birth, you again have a greater problem with the inspiration and the truthfulness of the Bible. If we cannot accept the truth concerning the virgin birth, I suggest to you that Christianity is nothing more than a myth. The virgin birth forces the world to get off the fence concerning the role of Jesus on earth. It tells us we cannot be neutral and we cannot say the stories of the life of Christ does not matter. Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. He came to this earth as the Holy Spirit affected the conception in Mary's womb and was born of Mary in Bethlehem. That is so important to our faith. Then we have the matter of salvation. Let me suggest to you that salvation hinges upon the virgin birth. If Jesus was born as a result of the natural relationship between Mary and some man, Jesus is no more than all the humans born before him and after him. The virgin birth teaches us that salvation is totally centered in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is totally the result of the supernatural, miraculous act of God. It began when God implanted the seed in Mary's womb. It was completed when God raised Jesus from the dead. It is made active in our sincere response to the message delivered by the, go the Gospels. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins, and where I am you cannot come. Without this knowledge and this acceptance of the divine mission of Jesus, again, according to the Apostle Paul, we are most miserable. We have no hope whatsoever. And as some of the philosophers have said, we're just like the dead dog rover. We're dead all over. And we have no resurrection. What does that do to our life? What is our purpose on earth? And why are we, we here? Let me suggest to you there has to be a, a, a reason why we're here. And Jesus was the reason. Jesus is the one that gives us hope. Jesus is the one that secures our salvation. Our salvation is the total 
work of God through Jesus Christ on, on this earth, you see. The gospel story and the coming of Jesus and his dying on the cross is the center of our faith. The gospel of John begins with the identification of Jesus as the word. John chapter 1 verse 1 begins by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In verse 14, John is going to continue. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, throughout the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, J John proves to us that Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. And that he is the Holy One. In him we have trust. It, we have faith. We have assurance, and we can know that through Jesus Christ and his mission on earth, we can have hope of eternal life. What would your life be like if you did not have hope in heaven? I have preached the officiated, we call it, uh, the funeral of many people. Some were Christians and some were not. And as I officiate at a funeral service for a person who was very evident not a Christian or someone that had a questionable faith, and I'm standing and looking out over that casket and that body in that casket, I cannot help but think, what is that person experiencing today? I have had to officiate at the funeral of some very close friends who were not Christians. And I ask the same question. What in the world can this person hope to achieve in this world? I suggest to you there's nothing. John chapter 1 and verse 12. John says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Folks, because of the miraculous work of God, we have the right of hope. We have the right to become the children of God. And as the children of God, we are blessed with the promise that in our Father's house are many mansions, and one day Jesus is going to return and he is going to receive us unto himself that where he is, there we may be also. What a great faith we have. What a great promise we have. And we just challenge all that are listening today to make absolutely sure that our faith is solid, that our faith is centered in Jesus and that we have a faith that will sustain us in eternity. God bless you and thank you for listening. And we just pray that this day will be very fruitful in your relationship with God and that your life will be filled with hope and security in Jesus Christ. May God bless you as you worship him today.